Go ahead and give it to him, brother. So, bro, I would appreciate, if possible, man, for me to see the audience, man. That would be, like, really cool. Nice, nice. So, um, first and foremost, man, I just want to big up the family, the organisers, you know, just for keeping, spreading the spores in the honour of the Grand Master Kalinde E. Um, I just want to send out my condolences to the family, the EE e. house, friends, family, you know, everybody that he connected with. And um, as some of you may or may not be familiar with me and my work, so I spent, you know, um, nearly 10 years working really close with Baba, supporting him here in the UK and Europe in spreading the spores. And I always say that the work that I've here in the UK and around, I just basically stand on his shoulders. He was a big inspiration to me, the majority is to many of you there. Um, I'm really baffled as to what I was planning to do today, man. I'm, my, my, I'm meant to be there. Like I feel like I'm meant to be there in Detroit with the family and connecting. And I just wanted to, to you know, basically just spend the first part of this just acknowledging Bubba and, you know, um, the role that he played in my life and many others. And then I want to share some slides. I initially said to the brother that we're going to be looking into psychedelics in the afterlife. I thought it was relevant just based on the current climate and circumstances. And um, that's what we're going to do, man. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. And um, how are you all doing there, man? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do, I, I, I'm going to try and share my screen. I might have yeah. to make you a host. Okay. Uh, where? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, yeah. hold on, Big D is coming. On this, yeah. Click more and then make co-host. Oh shit! If you make host, then you're not host. It's okay. Right. I trust him. It's on you, bro. You the host. Host it. All right. Give thanks. Let me do this. Nice. Is that up there? Can you see that? Cool. Is that viewable? Yeah. Yes. All right. Cool. Peace, family. Let's just let's, let's get into this one. So for those who are not familiar with myself, my name is Darren Sprint. Darren the Baron. Um, I'm based in the UK, London. Hold on. The screen is frozen, brethren. Oh, y'all ain't gonna stop this here. Mike, check, brethren. Your frame, your screen froze up. Your demonstration, that's, that's how powerful your demonstration is. Okay, he'll be right back. All right. You there? Can you hear me, bro? Yep. All right, let's do this. Hold on, I'm coming back to you now. Love the t shirt there, bro. Oh, this joint is hard, right? This joint is crazy, right? Five grams is better, baby. We got to get these on you right here. Absolutely. C certified. Yeah, please put one of those in a bag along with the brochure and all that. You call it, we haul it. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Okay. All right. 
So before I start any workshop or presentation, I always give these guys a shout out. These are, people. These are your Cuban strain. These were actually Cambodian. And if it wasn't for this technology, if it wasn't for this organism, I definitely wouldn't be standing up where I'm sitting down at the moment. I wouldn't be sitting here spreading the spores, sharing in the way that I do. Um, these were the catalyst, the fuel. They were a slap around the face, kick up the ass and all of that good stuff and supported me in becoming, um, in, in becoming, in, and I'm still becoming, and I'm sure there's many of you that are becoming based upon the technology. So before I start, as the most non-discriminative teacher that I've ever had, I'll always like to give these guys a shout out and I'd like for you all to give them a round of applause. All right. And when it comes to teacher in the physical form, there's not been many more that can top this guy. If I'll be honest, I've had many teachers in my life from, you know, my mother being the first school teachers, college teachers and all the rest of it. And this man, this is the day that I met him in the flesh for the first time in 2011. And from that day onwards, we formed a partnership, a relationship. And as a teacher, a friend, a mentor, a guide, a father figure and all of that good stuff. Um, I couldn't do anything else but from this day onwards to have his back. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Breaking Convention in the UK. It's the largest psychedelic conference we have pretty much in Europe. And this was the very first one in 2011. And when Baba turned up, he actually invited me. He flew over from Detroit, was flying over from Detroit and was like, don't you know about this conference in the UK? I was like, no. Nah. He says, yeah, you need to get yourself there. And I got myself there. We connected. And um, what I what happened at the event was it was the largest psychedelic, the first of its kind in the UK. There was over 200 speakers, you know, around 200 speakers, there was over 500 people in attendance. But Baba was the only person of color, the only black man speaking. And I was the only black man in the audience at this event, pretty much. And um, what happened is when Baba stood and spoke, he um, transformed the place and shook up the place at the same time. And when I realized or observed that he was the only man inside the building spreading the spores in the way that he was doing um, without having any ulterior motives or any um, any funding or you know reasons to not tell the truth or have you know mo hidden agendas or motives he was just like the, the purest one inside there and um, he effed up the dance that's what we say he effed up the dance because you know we shook we shook people up you know all the big wigs and after that, I felt that the fact that he was out there on the front line by himself, that that wasn't that one call. And from that day onwards, I said, anytime you come to Europe, I've got your back. You know, the fact that you're paying your way and flying in by yourself, these guys ain't paying your way or supporting you, but they're flying in other people first class and, you know, putting them up in nice hotels. And they've got you in, you know, a, in a hostel. You know, from that day onwards, I said, yeah, you, anytime you come to the UK, you're staying with me. And we formed a friendship. And, you know, as I said, this was, you know, a life changing time for me. You know, off the back of that, we created many events in the UK. We traveled around the world pretty much. You know, obviously, I got to go over to the States. We were in, we traveled around Europe a lot, you know, and just spreading the spores. And I always tell people, you may have seen, um, or people knew Baba for his, um, you know, his, in some ways, just very psychedelic information post 2011. But they didn't know that he was a master martial artist. And beyond being that, he played a key role in my life. And I know you've seen this before, maybe some of you, but this is who the gentleman is, man. If you don't know, this is who the guy was. And I'm not pretty sure he plays a Morpheus for many of you guys too. Um, and I say that simply because when he came into my life, he basically came with that, he came with the red pill and the blue pill. And for those of you who are familiar, you would know that the red pill is your Amanita and your blue pill is that psilocybin. And from that day onwards, the brother taught me how to cultivate, you know, and um, as I say to people, he taught me how to fish and become sustainable. You know that saying, you give a man a fish and he can eat for a day, but you teach him how to fish, and he's sorted for life. And that's what I believe what I've done for me and continue to do for others. But with that said, we fast track into the 2020 and we're in what's known as the psychedelic renaissance, according to some. And the reason why I know it's a renaissance is because of what's going on here in Detroit, um, simply because this wasn't the plan from what I understand as far as people 
of colour, people in the urban communities really having access to this type of information and applying it. And um, the fact that I'm talking about this when it's not, <laughs> it's not what I thought I'd be talking about, you know, coming up and the impact that we're having and, you know, just the testimony to Oi and the guys there just keeping the work going like it's testament to what's really going down. And um, I say that simply because when we think of the psychedelic renaissance, a lot of it relates to just the research that's going down. I'm not sure how many of you are privy to, you know, um, well, in the States, you guys have got maps, obviously. And in the United Kingdom, we've got Imperial College that are doing some amazing research when it comes to psychedelic research. But um, for the most part, you know, um, as Bubba would always say, and I, you know, I, I co-signed it, you know, they, it's considered a medicine, you know, in most parts. And uh, I, this, my research suggested that all of the research that was being presented was looking at this from a perspective of healing people who are sick. And in most cases, the research suggests that they wait until people have got their backs up against the wall and um, are, you know, at, at, are at a crossroads in their life. I'm saying that to say that the psychedelic compound in magic mushrooms, as some of you would know, is psilocybin and help with anxiety and depression in cancer patients. And, um, you know, my school of thought or my approach was, you know, do we have to wait till we've got cancer? Do we have to wait till we've got anxiety and depression before we understand what these tools and technologies are utilized for? And that's what I'd like to share with you this evening. And as we move forward, you know, a lot of the research is suggesting that magic mushrooms can help reset depressed brains. Um, let me ask you guys in the audience, because I like to really be interactive and it's really difficult working through the screen and stuff and not feeling the energy and the vibe of people. So I'd just like to know how many people in the audience, by a show of hands, have suffered from depression or know someone who suffered from depression? What about 30? 30. Is, is there anybody whose hands are down, brother? Well, I, I'm not buying that. I'm really not buying that. You know, I'm really not buying that. But I'll, 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 I'll keep it moving. I say that simply because further research suggests that um, soldiers who signed up for war, who ended up getting PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, were working with or supported with MDMA. And this MDMA trials or research that was done supported or helped 100% of these soldiers where 68% of the PTSD was totally eliminated and 32% was significantly reduced. So how does this work? You know, when people, you know, go to war, you know, they see heads getting shot off, you know, bodies getting blown up and then they come back, you know, they used to call it being shell shocked. And, um, you know, they can't, they can't fit into society anymore. And um, what I think, my, in my humble opinion, is a lot of these soldiers, I know in, in yeah, I don't know, you know, basically a lot of these soldiers signed up for this stuff, man. They basically signed up, they co-signed for this. But with that said and done, you know, they were able, they was able to on, in some cases, one sitting with MDMA supported with um, therapeutic support, were able to move, remove the PTSD. So again, this is great research. But again, coming from where I come from, and I guess you guys can relate. So I'm, I'm in the UK, first generation born in the UK by way of the Caribbean. And we come from, you know, socially deprived communities where I'm from. Um, you know, poor education, poor housing, all of that good stuff. And I'll say that to say simply because I work with young people who have primarily been kicked out of school, just come out of prison. You know, they call them the hard to reach or the bad kids. Um, I, I develop food enterprise projects with them. I'm sharing this with you simply because I work with soldiers, but they're not these types of soldiers. They're soldiers on the street, you know, people that are involved in gang activities, as they refer to them. We've got, you know, um, rivalries within different areas. And um, a lot of the experiences that these young people have experienced are similar to what these soldiers have signed up for and experienced, where I say I've got 14 to 16 year olds who have seen heads get blown off, who have seen their friends get stabbed and died right in front of them, have had to hold, you know, dead bodies in their arms. And you know what, two, three days later, they're back on the block, just getting on with what they need to get on with, whatever that is, you know, to make the buck. And I'm saying that to say that there's baggage that we carry, you know, that's why I asked earlier on how many people in there know that, you know, have suffered from depression or know someone who suffered from depression. Because what I've acknowledged is that we carry in general a lot of baggage and we don't, we're not aware of it in some cases. So it's no different from someone who's an alcoholic and they, they want to sort out their alcoholism they've got to go to AA 
you know, I'm sure, the, you know, one of the first things you've got to do when you go to AA, you know, you've got to put your hand up and you've got to say, you know, my name's Darren and I'm an alcoholic. And I've got to acknowledge what I've got and what I've got to deal with so I can start that journey. But when you don't know that you've got baggage, you know, you've got addictions, you've got trauma, and it's just the norm, it's just what we deal with, that then becomes, you know, even more detrimental and creates mental health challenges. So this is where I've discovered in my life, my personal life, and in the people around me, that we carry a lot and we're not aware of it. And these plants or the technology allows us to uncover that or unpack that. And that's where I feel science today is just catching up with our indigenous approaches to using these medicines. So that brings me to something called Iboga or Ibogaine, which is the active ingredient in Iboga. Some of you may have heard of Iboga, I guess for the most part people have, and you know, it's really popular for you know, alcohol recovery, heroin addiction, and um, as well as you know, and dealing with trauma. And um, when I first started my journey and in looking into psychedelics and came across, I wanted to find out more um, plants from the African continent in particular, and I was pretty much told, well, there isn't one, there isn't many plants, got, um, Darren, but you guys have got Iboga. It's good for heroin addiction. And, you know, the first thing my spirit said to me is that don't add up, man. I, I wonder if there's heroin addicts in Gabon or in the Congo where these plants come from. Because if there's not ha heroin addicts, then why would these plants be for heroin addicts? Like, it just didn't add up. And when I was asking the scholars, the teachers, the doctors, the scientists, they really didn't have much to offer in regards to what the plant's for. You know, how it can be used for the indigenous people themselves. Although they found a market for it and people are flooding to Africa as well as South America to have these experiences with Iboga or Ibogaine, but it suggests here that the drug harvested from the root plants found in Gabon, when all else fails, some heroin addicts use it to conquer their cravings. So what is that about? Why, are they, what, why have they... Or why are we looking at indigenous plants or the technology, not understanding what they're there for, in my humble opinion? Why have they been gifted to these people? Why were they gifted to these indigenous people? They're kind of bypassing what they suggest is what these plants are for. So it's great that we can address heroin and you know alcohol addiction because I've got that close to home as well. I've got drug addicts, you know, in my community. And we've got, you know, um, alcohol, you know, cl real close to home as well, alcohol addicts. So if we can support our people in addressing that with these plants, I'm all for that. But I really do think that we're missing a trick. Um, again, if we're approaching this as medicine, what we need to understand is that, in my humble opinion, and it's, you know, what these the groups are suggesting is that these are actually or can be used as preventative measures. And that's where I would like to go in today, just as far as how we can heal ourselves if we need healing you know, as well as heal our households and our communities, but not from the premise of how the research is suggesting we should do it. But when I came across this bit of research, I was like, ah, this is like on the money now, man. This is like closer to what my research was suggesting, why we were gifted these plants in the first place. You know, the effects of the psychedelic DMT, dimethyltryptamine, is similar to near-death experiences. And I was like, this kind of this wasn't what the research initially was about, you know, when they was looking into DMT, but then they further studied it, further looked into these studies. And this actually bit of research took place in the United Kingdom at Imperial College. And I'm, I'm familiar with the guys and they basically, they both, I think I've got this one, yeah, there we go. So um, the research suggested that the powerful psychedelic drugs are similar to near death experiences. Um, there was basically a questionnaire that was offered to the, to the participants and Dr. Robin Carhart, who oversaw the studies and his findings, suggested that near-death experiences occur because of significant changes in the way the brain works and not because of something beyond the brain. So that DMT is a remarkable tool that can enable us to study and thus better understand the psychology and biology of dying. So what this was basically revealed to me was that one, what the researchers were suggesting is that, you know, um, the near-death experience as well as the DMT experience are very similar but it was all to do with activities in the brain it was nothing beyond it was nothing spiritual it was nothing occult it was nothing esoteric but at the same time if we consider death as esoteric as an occult a hidden practice that we're that we you know that we um, align ourselves with um, the fact that DMT gives us the knowledge and the ability to understand that I would also want to look into what these indigenous cultures were using these plants for. And that will kind of 
lines us up with you know just understanding what are near-death experiences so normally I ask the question I would like to know just my surveying is there anybody in the audience that has a, had a near-death experience and has also taken DMT and would you keep your hand up and say to say if they were similar or very similar yes, or, or the, a similar experience is there anyone in there brother about three people four people Okay, so um, maybe they could vouch for this or not. Um, but a near-death experience is a personal experience associated with death or impending death. Such experiences may encompass a variety of sensations, including detachment from the body, feelings of levitation, total serenity, security, warmth, the experience of absolute dissolution, and the presence of a light. Near-death experiences are recognized as some part of transcendental and religious beliefs in an afterlife. What is an afterlife? How many people in there believe in an afterlife? Or is this the be all and end all here? Raise your hands high, you believe in an afterlife. Who knows, forget belief, who knows? Who knows about an afterlife? All right, all right, all right. So an afterlife is a concept, according to this article, that is an essential part of an individual's identity or the stream of consciousness continues to manifest after the death of a physical body. According to various ideas about the afterlife, the essential aspect of the individual that lives on after death may be some, part, some partial element or the entire soul or spirit of an individual. Now, I was taught by many of my elders and teachers, and Baba being the last one of them, you know, we don't die, man. We are immortals. And, you know, even, you know, in my older schools of thought, we were just taught that, you know, energy just transfers, you know, and changes and shifts and becomes something else. You know, any horticulturers in the house would know this, you know, all you need to do is be involved in composting. You know, I have a background in horticulture, and anybody who composts would know that nothing dies, everything transfers, and you, you know, the same waste material is what gives life. You start things all over again. So this is a cycle or pattern or a rhythm that you find in nature and exists on many levels. But where am I going with this? Back home, this is what we deal with on the African continent and in the Caribbean where my people are from, Barbados, this is what we deal with. Very much become a taboo subject, but no man can outwit the ancestors. That's an African proverb and it's approach that we have in life as a way of life. Because the ancestors, for those who are familiar and I guess I'm talking to the choir, you know, someone, you know, a relative of yours who is no longer here. And that relative could be blood or it could be a spiritual connected ancestor. But nonetheless, this is our technology. And, you know, Bob always introduced me to the organic technology. And there's different ways of utilizing the technologies that are out there. But the ancestors, for those of you who don't know that, you know, I've got it right here. I, you know, I work with young people and I'm always reminding them about technology. And, you know, they're always on their phones. My daughter's behind me, she's on her phone right now, she's not even listening to this, you know, she's on her phone there, paying this no mind. And I always say, you know, if I was to ask you for me to jump on your Bluetooth or your personal hotspot, you know, or, you know, any form of these technologies, like, we're, we're just, like, they could do it instantly. But we've been disconnected from the original technology where this has been inspired from. And that's where indigenous cultures that apply this are, are kind of referred to as primitive. And the work that they do in enabling them to work with their technology is buju, is voodoo, is black magic, it's dark. And that's what we want to remove, you know, that. So the reason why our people deal with the ancestors is simply because they are the hotline. They're the ones that are closest, the ones that we have access to, who have access yeah. to the spirit realm. Yo. Can you, like, back away from the microphone? Back away, back away from, from the microphone. Yeah, like, like, your voice is heavy. Like, you know, fam, say you super super clear but you're too clear you know what i'm saying so we can hear you good you know what i'm saying this and this can you back up a little bit give me another one two. Okay, no problem is that good so basically this diagram is just showing you the tribe at the center close um alongside the ancestors who sit in the center any permaculturist in the house we know it would be zone zero and as you move out you see that closer to the um the 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 tribe or the ancestors are closer to the tribe than other humans outside of the tribe. And you, within that sphere outside of the tribe, you also have spirits. And um, I always like to show this simply because it kind of gives reference to the fact that, you know, um, in, the, in our spiritual systems, 
um, the indigenous cultures were privy to the fact that not all spirits had human affairs at their, you know, at their best interest. Um, you know, there's, you know, even when you get into the mythology, you know, in the Bible, look, I've got one here. You know, it's, it's, I'm in a hotel at the moment, so there's one sitting on the table. But, you know, there's spirits, angels, guides who basically um, don't like humans, you know, and want, you know, are not for humans. And, our, you know, our people are aware of that. So, you know, the whole idea around, you know, the ancestors, your family members who have been here before and have had the human experience are kind of best qualified or, you know, the ones that you would go to for advice. No different from if you had an aunt, a mother, a father, a grandparents who, when they were here in the physical form, were very supportive of you in, your, in you becoming. They would be accessible on the other side and would support you on that journey too. And they would be, that's how you would, you know, tune into the, you know, to the technology. Whereas um, if you had, I don't know, if you had an uncle who was an alcoholic, a drunk and very unreliable, he may not be the person that you would call him to, or you would kind of double check, you know, his references. And we would have a group experience and we would divine. So then when we all download our files, we could collectively determine, you know, what advice was you given, what advice was you given, what was advice was you given. And if our uncle told us all to go to the east, because that's where the war was going to be, that's where we would head. And this was how we utilize the technology, the telepathic technology, as well as the intu intuitive technologies. But when you look at God, for lack of a better word, um, he's, or it is outside of that initial sphere, simply because according to mythology in, in most indigenous cultures, God is either, like in a nutshell, God is either dead, God's not interested, or God is so remote, so far away, that he doesn't hear our, you know, doesn't hear our, our call. So therefore, this goes back to why we work with the ancestors. They're the ones who have got access. They're the ones who we can easily just turn on our personal hotspots and you know, start that communication with. Why am I going for the ancestors? Simply because this is the way we communicate. And because this work is loaded, you know, you know necromancy, basically, which is the communicating with the dead, which growing up in my community was a taboo. It's something that you don't do. And all of these words that are associated with it are loaded, you know, alchemy, necromancy, witchcraft, sorcery, and black magic are all loaded words, but actually have a lot more substance to them. So for anybody who's heard of the word alchemy, you would know that's just dealing with, that's a, you know, a European word that is rooted in an Islamic word and which is rooted in a Kemetic word. So alchemy is actually just the science of blackness and you refer it to Asian chem or chem. And that's where we get the word chemistry and chemical and all these things are rooted in you know, in the word alchemy. And, you know, when you look at words like witchcraft, you know, that's just the wise craft and black magic was just basically black people's magic, African magic, it was all magic. And what, what I've discovered is once African indigenous people started, um, or it was discovered by Europeans, the magic of indigenous Africa, it was referred to as black magic and dark magic. But what I've discovered is that it's the same practice that most indigenous people around the whole planet pretty much do they engage with nature they work with nature rather than against it they understand you know the elementals and the spirits or the energies within everything and that's acknowledged and um you know um religion basically distorted a lot of this so i'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the necronomicon any, any occultists or esoteric people are in the house but i remember when i first got into this you know i was a student of bobby hemmett as well and bobby hemmett introduced me to this type of work and when I first started getting into this, I was told that these are the type of books you need to stay away from. But what I discovered is that the Necronomicon and this type of work of communicating with the dead is child's play. It's literally child's play. And I say that simply because when you go back home or wherever home is for you, I'm pretty sure that the indigenous people, this is introduced to the children. And the practices that you need to apply, which most of, like in my case, I didn't find out until I was in my 20s and 30s, by way of you know um, um, the kidnapping of indigenous people from Africa and the distribution around the Caribbean and then the trans or the trick the tricking into us coming to Europe um, I've been detached from this like many of you I guess have been detached and um, most of us don't get into this or get into this by way of you know I've, most people I speak to because they've had like a midlife crisis you know they're trying to rediscover themselves and they're hitting you know crossroads in their lives and stuff like that um, it's not something that they've been inspired to or in, in encouraged to do as, as a child. So where am I going with this? This work now that I'm about to share with you should be child's play. It should be introduced to the children. And that's why my daughter's here hearing out what I've got to say. And, you know, I believe in spreading the spores. And basically what I've discovered in my research suggests that this work or this practice is for navigating the underworld, 
you know, the realms where the ancestors reside, as well as for you to die or practice dying. Um, that's the ultimate trip. And I believe that's what these plants inspire us to um, experience. So um, it's no different. I always tell people, you know, if you've got a driving test, it makes sense that you prepare for your driving test before the day of the actual test. And the Asian Kemites and other indigenous cultures like in Mexico and other places where they have, you know, celebrations where they acknowledge death or they dance with death. That's what I've discovered they do. They don't wait till the day. You know, they dance with death in advance. They practice dying. And that's what these plants, the technology, enable us to do. So just a few references because we're just going to look into ego death. I know it's a buzzword. I don't know. I'm just chatting now. Yesterday, I was hanging out with a homie of mine and his children, who's a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old, introduced me to a new video. Who's seen the new Ty Dolla Sign video and Kanye West? Is that floating about over there? I guess so. No? Please, just do your, just do your Googles. Ty Dolla Sign and Kanye West have got a new, I think it came out two weeks ago, and it's called Ego Death. Just have that, yeah, that just one pops up. But we're going to get into Ego Death now for a split, for a split second. So here's just three references for those of you who are familiar with what Ego is and what people refer to as Ego Death. And um, again, Ego Death is a, you know, a, a concept you know, introduced to us by Europeans. But at the same, because I've discovered that in most indigenous cultures, they don't have the ego framework. But I understand it based on I'm educated from the Western, you know, school of thought. So I'm pretty sure you guys will get it too. But in this book by Nick Brommel, Tomorrow Never Dark Knows, Rock and Psychedelics in the 1960s, he says that ego death is a tempering, though frightening experience, which may lead to a reconciliation with the insight that there is no real self. An interview with Stanislav Grof, um, he said, I don't know, many of you may be familiar with Stanislav Grof, you should check him out. He suggests that death crisis may occur over a series of psychedelic sessions until they cease to lead to panic. A conscious effort not to panic may lead to a pseudo hallucinatory sense of transcending physical death. And Dan Merker in his book, Crucified Christ, Meditations on the Passion, Mystical Death and the Medieval Invention of Psychotherapy, he suggests repeated experience of the death crisis and its confrontation with the idea of physical death leads finally to an acceptance of personal mortality without further illusions. The death crisis is then greeted with equanimity. So this is basically suggesting for those of you who have had or have been close to or have experienced um, ego death or near death experience, what is suggested through these articles and once you experience it is basically that you, um, your, your, your load is lightened, you know, and um, you, um, you no longer, if you did have a fear or anxiety in, relate, in relation to death. And um, this is what the ego death experience um, inspires. But as I said earlier on, if you check out the indigenous cultures, this was a practice that they consciously wanted to invoke based on the research that I've seen. How many people know this guy here? White Jesus. Right. <laughs> So why well, I share that with you because this is the most famous ego death death story that I was aware of growing up. But as I share with people and my students here in the UK, you know, there's just one story, guys. There's just one story, you know. And as you, from, some of you would be familiar that you know the the Jesus story isn't necessarily an original story, and um, it was adopted, copied and pasted, and lifted from other um, mythologies. But nonetheless, there's some principles in there that are just that. They're principles and they, you know, and they hold firm. So um, I'm going to use this as a reference because it's like the most popular story that I'm aware of. And, um, and then we'll go back into some of the other stories or mythologies that tie in and you can see the consistency of what was the message trying to be delivered. So this gentleman here, Jesus, both supposedly died for our sins and resurrected and came around three days later and put in some work and then ascended. Some people, when I show this one, say it looks like Jesus or Yeshua, for lack of a better name, looks like he took a hit of DMT. And I said, that's exactly right. 
And for those of you who are familiar with John Allegro, I would love to think that this sound is gonna fall. I'm gonna play this video next. Um, John Allegro was basically a historian at, um, who was commissioned to translate or transcribe, should I say, the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, the SCN text that was found um, years, you know, a handful of years, or more than a handful of years ago. And when John went away and done the translations and the transcribing and came back, um, because this is, you know, the, the, the cult or the group that Jesus supposedly was affiliated with, um, when he done these Googles and came back and they asked him, well, John, what did you find? He says, you know, I found out a lot, but I don't think you're going to like what I found, church. And I said, what did you find out, John? And he basically says, you know, I found out things like Jesus, you know, may have had a wife, may have had children, he had siblings, you know, and it was just like a lot of contradictory information to what the church was currently propagating as, and so what still propagates. And John basically in his work was character assassinated, and you know, um, just like many of the people that are share in general, they get characters, character assassinated or assassinated, one or the other. And um, I'm hoping that the sound will play. I know you just need to give me a heads up. And um, this is just to kind of set the tone with this Jesus story or Yeshua story and how it relates to older stories and this psychedelic experience. Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear it once it starts. Can you hear? Was there sound? No, not on the, not on the, um, no sound on the video. Okay, bear with me. Big Bro, we appreciate you putting this together for us and uh, taking time out to share the broadcast to the family. Y'all put a round of applause and get a light. Look at yourself. Showing some love. Please, please use that for audio. Bear with me, bear with me. I'm trying to get the sound to play. All right, I can't find it, man, I can't find it. All right, family, sorry, I can't find the, um, the sound, the audio option. Okay, can I be heard? I'm back. All right, so in a nutshell, man, John is in being interviewed by the TV guy and he's asked about the Bible, the origins of the Bible and the stories in the Bible. And when he's questioned about the authenticity of the work, John's response to the interviewer is that none of the stories in the Bible should be taken literally. And the reporter says, well, what do you mean? He says, you know, the authors of the book, you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, these writers, you know, are you suggesting that they didn't write the book? And John's response is, look, there's no such people as John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Jesus. And he says, what are you talking about? And he says, you know, Jesus, for lack of a better word, is a mushroom. That was John's response. And the guy says, you can't be serious. What are you trying to say? Jesus is a mushroom? He says, yes, Jesus is a mushroom, along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he says, you can't be serious. And he says, I'm very serious. And it's all mushroom mythology. You know, and that the Christian church took the information from secret society, so to speak, and distorted the information, let's say, so that only those who were in the learned or those who learned the secrets would know the mysteries of what was withheld inside the text. 
And the guy says, look, you can't be serious. You can't be suggesting that Jesus is a mushroom. It's like, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. Jesus is a mushroom. So that's what that clip is all about. And you can find it on YouTube if, 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 if yourselves. But where am I going with that? You know, a lot of people give people a laugh and so forth. But I would say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater simply because those of you who are familiar with ancient Kemet and the stories of the mythologies that are, are older, these are, you know, older mythologies that were passed on to the Jesus mythology. And when you look at the Jesus story, you know that's inherited or lifted from the Horus story or the Heru story of Oset and Horu and the holy family of ancient Kemet. So where am I going with this? When you go back to Africa, they talk about this mythology, they talk about these um, species in, in, within the mythology or the technology. So before we get into Kemet, I'm gonna go to the people who the ancient Kemites inherited their wisdom from in the Nile Valley. And that was the so-called pygmies of the Congo or the central regions of Africa. And according to them, who are the oldest recorded people we can find on earth, they've got a myth reported by W.F. Bonin in 1979, in which the mushroom, a long cock, plays a crucial role in the genesis of the universe. The earth originated from a mushroom, as from an egg. More precisely, the mushroom considered as having the shape of an egg, split in the middle, the upper half rose and became the sky, the lower part became the earth, and from the two halves of a long cock, all visible things came out stars, the sun, mountains, rivers, plants, the animals, and the great mother, also called a long cock. So for me, this was part of the research where I wanted to find the oldest people and find the oldest creation stories to see what did they say about how we got here. And according to these, um, the so-called pygmies, they're saying that all life count came out of a mushroom. And I know not to take these stories literally, but this is one that you could take literally. If there's any mycologists in the house, if there's anybody here who knows about mycelium, if there's anybody in here who knows about panspermia, if anybody in here knows about soil formation, anybody in here knows about composting, you would know that all life starts from and goes back to mushrooms. You can't get away from it, whether we like it or not. The planet that we live on was a bedrock planet. It was a big rock. It's not always been green. It's become green because of this technology that is alien technology that came, embedded itself in the earth and started to transform it. This is what the elders and the ancients have been talking about for millenniums. This is in the ancient texts, it's in the Enuma Elish, it's in the Atcha Hashish. These are all the books that inspired the books like the Holy Bible. And according to the, the pygmy people of Central Africa, they would also say that all things come out of this mycelium or mushroom experience, including the Great Mother. And what I found out was that in Africa, in many of the cultures, um, mushrooms, heaven and the great mother all have the same name there's a connection between mushrooms the great mother and heaven and in my humble opinion they're all to do with gateways they're all gateways and portals but um, again that's another subject we'll come back and i want to swiftly move through now to get to the crux of the matter basically what we're looking at here is the real deal people these are the so-called pygmies they're called, i say so-called because that's not who, how they refer to themselves they have a range of different names they're known as the akka the baka the twa the mbuti the babongo depending on where they're located or what blood runs through their veins in gabon ancestor ancestor cults still flourish in the 21st century Whoops. their members share a common belief based on direct experience hear that people can you hear that direct experience no middleman, no shaman, no priest, direct experience in the existence of a supernatural realm where the spirits of the ancestors may be contacted. The Babongo are the originators of the Briti religion. The Briti religion is a synchronistic religion of the original indigenous African religion and the Christian religion that was enforced upon the people. Similar to like Santeria, Condomble, and various other traditions that you find in the Caribbean and South America. But the hallucinogenic the Babongo are the originators of the Briti religion based on the consumption of the hallucinogenic Iboga plant. Briti practitioners use the root bark in ceremony to promote radical spiritual growth, stabilize community and family structure, and to resolve pathological problems. The root bark has been consumed for hundreds of years in the Briti rite of passage ceremony, as well as in initiation rites and acts of healing. The experience yields complex visions and insights anticipated to be valuable to the initiate and the chapel. But where am I going with this? Basically, 
when I started my journey in the psychedelic journey, I wanted to grow spiritually. When I started to come across this and I saw that this could help you grow spiritually, but not just spiritual growth, it was radical spiritual growth. I was really up for it. And then in addition to that, it will stabilize community. I don't know what's going on where you guys, you're in Detroit right about now, but I know you're from all over the States and all over the world potentially, but my community could do with some stabilizing where I'm from. And I'm wondering if you guys in your communities, it could do with some stabilizing. And in addition to that, family structures, I don't know where, you, where it's like where you're at right now, but where I'm from, it's not happy 2.4, you know, households with a dog, cat and a budgie and everybody gets on, you know, holding hands and kumbaya in. A real, a, there's a, you know, a real lot of dysfunctional households, families where I'm from and what we work through. And then in addition to that, you know, the plants can help resolve pathological problems. So this goes back to earlier on, me asking, is anybody out there suffering from depression or anxiety or know anybody who has, or is there anybody out there that does stuff that doesn't serve them well and they continue to do it? Like, you know better, but you still do it. And I'm one of those. And I'm sure if you're honest enough, you would acknowledge that you've got some of that into you too. And I'm saying that to say that these plants are preventions, preventative measures. That's why in these cultures or traditions where you find the usage of these plants, they don't have these challenges that we have in the West where we're supposed to got everything that we need, you know? So with that said, all the experiences that the community or the collective has, as I said, is a form of divination. And then once everybody has their own direct experience and you know, then you can come back and you can reason and rap with people with, with, with true understanding. And that's where I feel that we've missed a trick in the West when we're looking at it as a medicine and waiting or looking at it, waiting for the problem to occur and then seeing that these plants can be used as a heat for healing modalities. So where am I going with this? This is just basically just to kind of give you a backdrop into these plants, the research that was being done back in, well, the research that's being done now, as I showed you earlier on, that relates to death and depression and all the type of stuff. But when you go back and see these cultures, they've been using it for that and preventing these things. When you get to the fact of why these plants were gifted to these people, you have to hear it from the horse's mouth. So Zambi or Zami, the last of the creator gods in the Briti culture, gave us Iboka. That's how they refer to Iboga, Iboka. One day he saw the pygmy Beetamu high near Tanga tree gathering fruit. He made him fall, he died, and Zambi brought his spirit back to him. And be cut off the little fingers and little toes of the dead body of Beetamu and planted them in various parts of the forest. They grew into the Iboga bush. So anybody there who's eaten Iboga, chewed it, just know that you weren't eating little fingers and little toes. There are there is another version. There's various versions of this story. Um, there's the porcupine version as well. But again, when you get to the root of what is the principle of the stories, they all stay the same. So the story continues. Beetamu's wife, a Tanga, again the hero or the heroine you're going to see again these stories they um, correspond or tell as I said there's one story that is kind of repeated Beetamu's wife Atanga heard of the death and went in search of his body after many adventures she finally came to a cave and saw a pile of human bones as she entered the cave she suddenly heard the voice of her dead husband asking who she was where she came from and whom she wished to speak with the voice told her to look to the left of the cave there was the aboka plant the voice told her to eat its roots. She ate and felt very tired. The voice told her to turn around in the cave. The bones were gone, and in their place stood her dead husband and other dead relatives. They talked to her and told her that she had found the plant that would enable men to see the dead. This was the first baptism in Briti, and that was how men got the power to know the dead and have their counsel. So in a nutshell, according to the people who this plant was gifted to, they say it was gifted to them, so they could communicate with the dead. It wasn't for heroin addiction. It wasn't for alcohol recovery. It was for communicating with the dead. So this is the technology that we've got and how it's to be used. Is this just Ebola? Is this just in Africa? Is this just you know unique to this part of the world? Well, these are the gangas. Some people refer to them as shamans or the witches or the witch doctors from this region. And I just think these are beautiful pictures, so I'll just put them up. And this is the technology, once again, these are the maps, these are the blueprints that allow you to access your energetic bodies, or I, I like to refer to them as your entheogenic fob keys that give you access to not just in the physical world, places and spaces you need to go, but also on the other side. So I'm here to share with you, if you didn't know, there's some real little people, the twa, the akka, the baka, and so forth. And you've got small people that exist in the spirit world, as you would know, or may know, or will get to know. 
And some of the oldest ones we can find are in ancient Kemet that's recorded. And the ancient Kemites or the Egyptians inherited it from these same small people that you find in the Congo or Central Africa. And when he made his way into Kemet, he became known as Bess. So Bess is a pre-dynastic deity or Nater. Nater is a singular of the Nateru, and the Nateru are, for lack of a better word, the deities or the gods or the pantheon of the Kemetic system. And Bess is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, we can find in stone in recorded history. And as I said, the Kemites inherited him from the small people. And since then, he's become all of the archetypes that we could possibly think of in Christian. And remember, we're starting off with this Jesus story. I know and you may be like drifted, but it really ties in because this is Jesus. This is Father Christmas. This is God. This is the Easter bunny. This is, you know, all of the festivities that we celebrate in, you know, in, in this part of the world now is rooted in this archetype because Bess was the god of festivities or the deity of festivities, liberation parties, as well as the protector of mothers, pregnant women and all of that type of stuff. So he has many attributes. But the main thing that I'm going to share with you today is about his, the branding of Bess, of the mouth open and the tongue sticking out. And if you look at all of his pictures, wherever you see him, he's the only one, along with Hathor or Hetheru, who was also a pre-dynastic, um, his pre-dynastic counterpart. And they're the only ones that you see on front profile. And remember, if you don't know, Hathor or Hetheru is the cow deity. And you're going to start seeing a combination or the connection between Bess, Hetheru, and the amazing ingredients that they provide us with. So Bess is also, for those who might have heard of Ibiza, was where, basically where Ibiza was named after Bess by the Phoenicians. But Bess later becomes Patar, because what you're going to find that in the different regions of Kemite, if you don't know, the, the, like for me, it's like in the UK, it's like football teams. Different regions had different deities, had different gods, different pantheons that they acknowledge or they put higher than others. So on the earlier date, Bess was the main man, and later on, Patar inherits that role. And Patar is the creator god, god of gods who existed before all things. He was also the god of rebirth and was sometimes credited with the open of the mouth ceremony, which restored life to the deceased. This is where we get the whole concept of little green men and aliens and all of that type of stuff from. Leprechauns in this part of the world in the UK, we've got um, in Scotland, the whole green leprechauns and in Ireland and mythology. And this is where you find the indigenous so-called pygmies, the brown to black curly haired people who were the first people in this land too. And this is where you find remnants of this and the branding of Bess and Patar. And this is a priesthood that traveled from ancient Africa into Europe. And it starts with Patar in his mushroom pose. Patar, when he moves to the, into Europe, becomes Peter. I don't know how many of you are familiar with St. Peter. St. Peter is the rock of the Christian church. Patar, Peter, Patar, Patar is the mound or the foundations of which the Kemetic mystery system was based upon in Memphis, the capital. So you're going to start seeing how stuff, just like the Kemites inherited best, different people inherit the same prototype, the same archetypes, and they basically just make them look like themselves. They shift them to look like themselves, you know, culturally and physically and so forth. So Peter... As we know, according to John Allegro, wasn't a real wasn't a real dude. It was all mushroom mythology, remember. But when you see the Pope today, he's mimicking or role playing Peter, who supposedly, according to the Church, was the first Pope. So when you get Peter, Patar, Peter, and the Pope, this is Pope Francis. You've got to understand the synchronicity of what these what role is being played. Remember, Patar is credited with the open of the mouth ceremony. When you've got the Pope here or the Cardinal, Peter Apaya, who was going to be the Pope at one point, or was potentially going to be the Pope, um, when Pope John Paul had died before Pope Francis got it, I came across this image and it just triggered me as to say, and I always show this on all my slides, as to why is Peter, Patar here, got a hat on, underneath his hat? I don't know how many brothers or sisters in there got hats on, and if he was asked any of them to lift their hat off, would they have a second hat underneath their hat? And it's very unlikely. I've done this test several times. And I've... Mike, check. Come back one time for me. Your mic froze. You might have to go out and come back. 
You can tell it's getting juicy when it starts freezing like that. That's what I say. I'll be like, the damn devil is hard at work right here. You know what I'm saying? Devil, get your ass up out of here. That's right, Darren. Come on back. We ain't gonna let the devil get you. Y'all get me off. Nah, that that was the devil. <laughs> that was the devil. You was doing you was over here doing God's work. The devil was like, hold up, boy. Hold up, boy. Oh, we're in a church as well. You're in a church, aren't you? I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. Over here snitching in the church. Shit. Not today, damn it. But we represent Dog Star. Dog Star? One time for Darren, I said Dog Star? Dog Star? All right. So, um, the hat, the hat that we just saw Peter wearing. Is the skull cap worn by the Catholic clergy and it's called a zaketo. It's similar in appearance but not identical to the yarmulke which the Jewish men are required to wear during any sacred ceremony or in a sacred place. I'm assuming that most people have seen this or are familiar. That's my... The zaketo is worn throughout most of the mass. You're in church. It's removed at the commencement and replaced at the conclusion of the Holy Communion when the blessed sacrament is put away. The zaketo is not worn at any occasion where the blessed sacrament is exposed. The short zaketo stand, known as a fungalino, little mushroom, is placed near the altar to provide a safe place for the zaketo when it's not being worn. I don't know if you guys are following this. You're in church right now. So when it's Holy Communion on Sunday and the priest brings in the blessed sacrament or the Eucharist, the congregation of priests will take off their hat and place it on a stand called the little mushroom. When the ritual or the ceremony is over, they then put the place to hat back on their head. This ceremony is called Holy Communion, where I'm from. The Eucharist has got different names depending on what church or denomination you're involved in. But where I'm from, it's called Holy Communion. And that literally means to communicate with the Holy or the Divine. We're communicating now to commune. But what makes communicating holy? How can you, commu how can you communicate with the Holy? That's what this ritual ceremony is about. How many people there have participated in Holy Communion ritual in a church before? How many of you communicated with the Holy when you've done it? I don't know if I can see any hands, but I, I see less than the ones that were up before. Why am I saying this? Simply because there's a missing link. Anyway, this is the stand, just so you know what they refer to as the little mushroom. And this ritual, this ceremony that the priest performs called Holy Communion comes from this ritual or ceremony performed by Jesus or Yeshua in the Bible, which was known as the Last Supper. And always highlight that it was the Last Supper because he was aware or privy to the fact that he was about to die. So he's got this ritual or ceremony where he's invited his homies around and they're all breaking bread. They're going to have something to eat. Now, if Oi invited me to Atlanta and we're all just saying, look, man, it's the last day we're all going to have something to eat. Bro, I don't need you to feed me. I don't need you, you know, I always ask the question as to why is Jesus breaking bread and feeding his disciples? Why is, why are they looking at the bread in that way? What makes the bread, because if it's just bread, like they say it is, because when you go to the church, they give you this, this wafer, which is symbolic of the bread or the unleavened bread. But when you go into the Bible or you go into the, the Bible or the Quran, you see that this bread, because the bread comes up a few times, the bread is referred to in Hebrew is manna, M-A-N-A -A or M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, or it's a Kemetin word, M-E-N-N-U, menu, which means food or food from heaven. So this bread that Jesus got is food from heaven or bread from heaven. Sorry. This isn't the bread from heaven. Why is Yeshua or Jesus doing this? Why is he distributing the bread amongst the congregation? Why are they kneeling and praying? As I said, when you look at this one here, the guy to the left looks like he's begging for the bread. Why? Because what Jesus is doing is what any ganga, shaman, or curandero, who is an entheogenic distributor of substances would be doing. They bless the sacrament and they distribute it amongst the congregation so they can have Holy Communion. I'm here to share with you guys 
that Jesus, Yeshua, is an entheogenic distributor. That wafer is and should be the mushroom. The food from heaven, the bread from heaven that fell from heaven is the spores that came from heaven, came to earth and grows and was harvested and enables us to have holy communion. This is the bread. This is the word. I hope I'm not offending anybody. And if I am, so be it. Yeah, but yeah. Saying, <laughs> this is what this stuff is rooted in. And we've been given, we've been hoodwinked basically. Well, I was, for those of you privy to it. And now we know what we're dealing with. We can find out where we get the divine word from or that divine communication. And according to this book here, Kalpi Ruck and others, in Mushrooms, Mifra Mifras, the drug cult that civilized Europe. How many of you guys in there are familiar with the Moors from North Africa who civilized Europe? Who knew that they were using psychedelics to do this? It was a big part of their mission. Neither did I until I started coming across this work. I just thought that they brought, you know, the knowledge, algebra, sewage systems, and all that type of stuff. But their main agenda, their main movement was setting up these, you know, houses that were led or inspired by the usage of psychedelics or psychoactive drugs, in particular mushrooms. And various cults, secret societies were birthed out of these Moorish um, voyages. So in the book here, he says, bull's blood and ass meat, or ass meat as you say over there, sorry, appear to be the equivalent like the Eucharist bread and wine, what they give us in the church. So the bread is wafer, the wine might give us a state of conscious or make us feel a certain way but it's not the same because they say that the blood and body of the deity apis or apis which is the bull deity or incarnation of patar Petar, patar is one of the tiny giant deities like the greek gods the greek great gods of the samurai race Herodotus mentions that cambyses was amused by the images of patar that he saw in the god's temple in memphis that they were Phallic genie, spirit gnome headed dwarfs, like the mythical pygmies. These swollen headed, infallic little big creatures were quite simply anthropomorphized mushrooms. The alternation in size of these creatures from pygmies to giants is a mythical expression of shift in visual micropsia and macropsia experienced by those who have ingested the consciousness altering mushrooms. I'm going to keep moving swiftly. Fell God, Fractured Myth in a Fragile World by John A. Rush in his book. He's a cold D, they're partners, him and Carl Ruck. He says Patar and Osiris. Osiris is a later version of Patar. I know we all know about Osiris, Osiris and Osar, but he's like the, a later version, you know. He and then Jesus becomes a later version of him, you know. It's just like you've seen it, it's just one story. If you can follow the troll, they're just one story. And Patar and Osiris in Egyptian tradition are wrapped up as mummies and resemble the stalk of a mushroom. He says, I am certain the Hebrews were familiar with this mushroom because the ancient Egyptians obviously were aware of this and other mind altering substances. And the Catholic artisans coded its existence and importance in their mosaics and stained glasses. I'm just going to keep moving because what you're going to find out is that there's one story, guys. So if you're not sure about the Holy Sacrament and the Eucharist from the biblical perspective, because it's been hidden and removed from our, you know, from our, from our, you know, from our eyes. You've got to go get into the mythology because myth science is just catching up with mythology and it's in all the mythologies all around the world from what I can see. And when you go into European mythology and you go into the Greek mythos, you find this deity and her name is Persephone. And you're going to, whoops. How many people in there are familiar with Persephone and her story? Cool. So Persephone is the goddess of the underworld. Springtime, flowers and vegetation. Sounds very much like Osar's characteristics when you start getting into it. And her mother Demeter were the central figures of the Eleusian Mysteries. For those of you who are not familiar, the Eleusian Mysteries was a secret society, so to speak, that would, the initiates who attended this would basically be um, introduced to ways where they could have a more enjoyable death or prepared for death. So you're going to start finding this whole connection with these archetypes, these figures like Persephone, like Jesus, like Osar, that are all got these connections with death. They're the main figures in the systems, or one of the main figures, but they've got this connection with death. And they've got this secret ingredient that they use as well from heaven or the underworld. 
So for those of you familiar with Persephone's story, for those of you who don't know, she's captured by Hades, the god of the underworld. And she's taken to the underworld and spends three days in the underworld, just like Jesus spent three days in the underworld before he resurrects. And in her story, without getting into it too much, she's captured, taken down into the underworld. And then because she represents life, vegetation, sex, and all of that good stuff, basically, Earth misses her. Earth, she's in requirement for um, her, that energy, that principle is needed on Earth. So for the three days, um, Earth starts to fall, and we need to bring Persephone back to bring life again. Where am I going with all of this? It's one story that's being told over and over again, the Jesus story, the Persephone story. But the difference with stories is when you get into the older mythologies, there's a bit more con content, there's a bit more substance. The, the missing links that you find in the Bible, for example, are still there. But when you go to Persephone and her story and her last supper, and when Jesus holds up the bread, you can see what her and her mother hold up. Persephone and her mother Demeter are admiring each other's mushrooms. The former mythical abduction of by Hades underlines the fertility rites, which ultimately became the psychedelic celebration at Eleusius. So this the Lucian mystery system is basically rooted in the mushroom experience, which supported individuals that were partaking this understanding or facing or dancing with death. How many of you are familiar with Inanna? We're nearly there. I'm going to be wrapping it up real soon. How many of you are familiar with Inanna? Anybody in there, Inanna? Or Ishtar, she's commonly known from the Sumerian pantheon. Same story. You would know her story then. She ends up spending, again, three days in the underworld. Slight variation in the story. But when she goes through the, into the underworld, she's got to go through seven gates. And as she gets through to the last gate without getting into it, because I love this story. It's like one of the best versions of the story that I like, because if I keep it funky, Ishtar Inanna is a bad bitch. And I like how she moves. And when she goes down into the underworld, she's kicking down doors and stuff. She's not even invited down there. She's kicking down doors really cocky with it and by the time she gets down there she's got to go through these gates and she's not invited and then when the gatekeepers say to her hey what are you doing down there they go to her sister Arishkagul who's like whose domain it is and says look your sister's at the gate making holy for noise she wants to bust through here she will let her in and she's like let her through and in a nutshell Inanna dresses up for the occasion and she's got to go through these seven gates before she can get to the where Arishkagul is and when she gets through the seven first gate she's got to remove an item of her clothing by the time she gets to the last gate she has to remove all of her clothing she's there naked and cut a long story short people if you've got to check out the mythology for yourself but she ends up getting killed and dies same thing again three days comes up because earth needs her and then there's a relationship between her going back to the underworld and coming back to earth but what you start to understand is that these seven gates that she goes through corresponds with the seven chakras because it's you, you're taking that inward journey, the ego death type journey, which today we refer to it, but in ancient the world, they just called it dying or practicing for dying or the open of the mouth ceremony that would prepare you for death. And we're nearly there because this is the last version of the story and we're going to open it up or close it down and then open it up with the sacred union couple in ancient Kemet. Isis and Asor or a set on Asor, the only reason I want to highlight this is because how many people are familiar with what she's holding in her hand? What is it called? The Ankh. Why is she putting it in his mouth for? You guys been watch Bubba's videos? This is the mushroom, guys. It's the mushroom. It's the glyph for the mushroom. The key of life. This is the Holy Family anyway, this is the Holy Family, we'll get it. this is the Holy Family, the Trinity, Father, Mother and Child. For those of you who don't know, in the Egyptian or Kemetic mythology, one of the first couples are Aset and Asar. They are said to have emerged from the Acacia tree, which in the Egyptians considered the tree of life, referring to it as the tree in which life and death are enclosed. For those of you who don't know, the Acacia tree is a DMT containing tree, which is a psychoactive ingredient. So when you see these glyphs like the one in front of you here, you've got Tahuti to the left, the scribe, the god of wisdom, and Shashet, his consort, on the right. You know, some, according to some, the leaf or the flower on her head represents the cannabis and plant. But at the same time, I all know that a lot of us know about Tahuti, or Thoth, as he's known as. And he um, is credited with being the, the wise one. But when you get into mythology, you find that that 
he's just the scribe. And it's his wife, Shashet, who actually whispers the mysteries into his ear, and he describes it, and he's the messenger and delivers the message. But with that said, when you see the pharaoh, or the paheru, as we would say in the Kemetic language, which is the hero, just know that that's you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, sitting in the center, that is you. You are the hero. You need to put yourself in the glyphs in this way where you understand that you are on your own hero's journey. And when you, just like Belinde taught me, and I'm sure he taught you guys, he taught me this. He says, D, you can either keep reading about the gods or you can hang out with them. And there's ways that you can hang out with the gods. They can come and hang out with you or you can go out and hang with them. But all you need to do is partake in the tree of life. <laughs> I lost you there. Say that again for the people in the back. What did Kalinde tell you? He told me that you can either keep reading about the gods or you can hang out with the gods. And he was like, so what do you want to do, D? And I says, I want to hang with the gods. Because I'm into mythology. I read a lot of mythology books and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you can read the book and you can engage with the gods. And that's what these glyphs are about. And what they're showing you, me and I, that we are the hero on the hero journey. We are the pharaoh, our heroes. Because that's where the word hero comes from, Horus or Heru. Show this one here. And this is the story of the hero, the baby hero, where all the child who becomes, who's becoming. And I won't go into the glyphs, but this is just to show you Heru or Horus in his falcon or hawk form, standing on his vehicle. You can see, like he's standing on something, the bird to the right looks like mushrooms. They refer to them as the, the reeds, but they also look like, definitely like mushrooms to me. I'm going to keep moving. This is Horus or Heru standing on the space and the place that he governs. People familiar with this glyph looks like a mushroom, but it refers to the holy or hidden land known as Amenta. The Amen, Amen, like we say at the end of our prayers, which means hidden. Ta means land. The hidden land was Amenta. Horus or Heru was the protector of the hidden land, guard, the guardian. What was the hidden land? What was all that about? We're going to get there. The hidden land, if you wanted to get there or make your way through there or navigate the hidden land, you would need a book of the dead. How many people in the audience has got a book of the dead? Anybody got their book of the dead? What I'm very confident about, without being cocky or sounding cheeky, is that none of you have got your Book of the Dead. What you have got is Annie's Book of the Dead. That's the Book of the Dead that's being circulated at the moment because the papyrus of Annie was just that. It was Annie's Book of the Dead because the Book of the Dead was basically your own book, your book of life or death. And everybody had their own version. There wasn't one, it wasn't like the Bible where they're saying this is the book for everybody. The Book of the Dead or the Book of Coming Forth by Day is basically developed over your lifetime when you're born the, the god the you know for lack of a better word the shaman does his divinations and he starts giving you your mantras your affirmations your key words your colors your numbers all the things that you're going to need on your journey of life into the underworld or into a mentor so what you would need to do is have your own experience nobody could do this for you and this is what the hero's journey was all about and they say that the ancient Egyptians' obsession with death was in fact a preoccupation with life. And we're nearly there, people. And that's why I showed you this earlier on, this key of life, the unk. I've heard so many interpretations of this over the years. You know, it's the key of life, the female, it's the male, masculine. It represents heaven, the lower realms, and, you know, all, 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 many different forms. But I always used to ask why they keep putting in people's mouths. Why is it in, you know, why, why is it being... And it's part of this open of the mouth ceremony that I've showed you is the Holy Communion, where you put something in your mouth that allows you to navigate the underworld, because it was your key. It is the key. And this is just the journey, just to show you what I want. So once you partake in the substance, you start to navigate with your gatekeeper, who's Anpu or Anubis. And even here, sorry, I just missed it. If you look to the right and you see the goddess on the right, what's, you've got Horus or Anpu, I mean Horus or Heru, on the mushroom sitting on her head. This is why we're all mushroom. I talk go around telling people, you know you're a mushroom, innit? You're just a mushroom head, whether you like it or not. And these were what the Kemites were dealing with anyway. So once 
Anubis or Anpu, your guardian, prepares the body. That's what he is. He was the mummy, the mummifier. And the mummy, again, is another ceremony um, birthed out of the mushroom experience, observing the cocooning of the bugs or of species when the mycelium colonizes or takes over its host and then something new comes out of it. And that's what the Kemites were practicing or preparing when they mummified the ritual because although the human body was cocooned, they knew that the spirit, the car, the vehicle would be able to trans, you know, be able to move it. That was the vehicle. That's why we call it a car and we drive cars. So Anpu or Anubis would prepare the body, the physical body, so the spirit could do its work. He said, or it said that in the field of rushes was the afterlife for the ancient Egyptians, the paradise they had been striving to reach throughout their lifetime and the final destination of their journey through the underworld. And this is it, guys. This is the open of the mouth ceremony preparation. This is where the, you can see, I mentioned earlier on Hathor or Hetheru, the cow deity. For those of you who don't know, the reason why, just like in India and Kemi and the Dinka tribes and all these various people have sacred cows and bulls is because magic mushrooms grow in the dung. That's what makes these cows, bulls, um, ungular animals sacred. It's not because they provide milk and meat and manure like the other animals. It was something very unique about these um, um, ungular animals and it was the mushrooms that grow on their dung. So you find the cows or the bulls in Amenta, in the underworld, and they're producing these white cats, as you can see. They get passed along and put into the initiate's mouth. You remember, you are the initiate. And then you're on this journey, but you need a vehicle. You know what I'm saying? You can't just go anywhere without the vehicle. So you need a boat or a car. And this was the boat of Ra, which was your vehicle. And the vehicle also had a conductor, you know, a driver. And the driver is Kephara. And he drives the vehicle or steers it. And he's the dung beetle. And in the dung beetle, the shit, the dung, where the life force is, the key to life. Like I said, if you're a composter, if you're a horticulturist, you know how important dung is. You know how important farmyard manure is. You know how important worm castings are. This thing is our life force. It's the waste, the worst, but it's the most important thing that keeps this thing sustained. So the ancient Kemites understood this and so did the, they observed the scarab and the scarab would roll up the dung and from the dung, it would put its eggs inside there and then out of the dung balls would come new life as well as mushrooms growing. So they considered the scarab sacred and it was the conductor, it was the micro world, it was a micro universe that existed in the ship. And this was all corresponding with you and your vehicle and the vehicle that when you partake in these substances, what you become. And this is known as the Merkaba, and that is the vehicle or your light body that allows you to travel through these states of consciousness or through these various realms. And once you do, you're enabled to go through the judgment scene or the halls of Ma'at and the 42 negative confessions where you need to determine whether your heart is lighter than the feather or not. And that just basically means people not feeling bad or guilty for things that you've done, moving forward, moving on. It doesn't mean that you've not committed a sin before. It means that you just let that baggage go and you don't carry it around with you. You don't harbor any bad thoughts or bad vibes, that type of energy. You know who you are, you stand on your square. And once you do, you can move and navigate. And once you move and navigate, Amit isn't able to swallow you up and bring you back into the matrix again. And then you can navigate into the realms of Osar. And as you can see here, the ongoing story, the one story again is that you go through the seven doors of the house of Osiris. This is no different through the seven gates that Ishtar or Inanna has to go through. And once you go through the seven gates, there's another 21 portals. And you can see that we're working with prime, num not prime numbers, sacred numbers, basically, and repetitive numbers, because it all corresponds with stuff that's going on inside of you. This is all taking place inside of you, not outside. And throughout the underworld journey, the deceased spirit would have to contend with God's strange creatures, gatekeepers to reach Osiris and the hall of final judgment. They would plead for their case into the afterlife. And that's what happens. You get to that life, afterlife, you get to the end. And like any other computer game, any other virtual game, who remembers um, games like this? Yeah, Pac-Man, you know, you get, I remember there was a game that I used to play when I was young called Shinobi. And, you know, you have to always beat the boss at the end and there's different techniques for beating the boss. But these bosses or these demons are just that, your demons, these hidden forces that don't serve you well. 
And once you defeat them or beat them, you can move on. And that's what the ego death experience is all about. It's a game, people. You're meant to have fun with it. You're meant to enjoy it. And if you knew that the ancient Chemites saw it in the same light, you would see it in the same light and understand how to use the technology for what it's worth. Just like the indigenous Japanese with the Iboga, with the mushrooms, with the ayahuasca, they call it the vine of the soul, better yet, the vine of the dead. It enables you to commune with the dead and go to the places and spaces where they live and dwell, and you can prepare for yourself and being in those spaces. And ultimately, what it enables you to do is not have to invest loads of money in virtual reality, as you would know, five grams plus will get you into these places and spaces without having to spend this kind of money on this equipment. And in addition to that, you will have live access to the realms of the Medaneta or the hieroglyphs. And for those of you who've seen and familiar with Kalinde sharing with us that the hieroglyphs or the Medaneta is nothing but a DVD player. With the right grammage and the right set and set in an environment, the glyphs will come alive and you will access or they will access you, the farm. And as you can see here on the glyphs, this is an elder with the child sniffing blue lotus, which is also uh, not a psycho, traditional psychoactive, but it's similar to like MDMA, creates, you know, euphoric states of consciousness. But yes, you can sniff this stuff and you can bring the glyphs to life. And that's me, Darren Springer, also known as Darren the Baron. And I'm here to share with you why we should be taking psychedelics so we can navigate the afterlife and commune with the dead and live a more prosperous life. Pick up yourself, pick up yourself. Mm -hmm. Back on the screen, get it back up, man. Come on back on the screen so people can see your face, man. Yeah, let tomorrow. me, um, how do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. I'll make some noise one more time for Darren real quick. Hey. Um, it's comments, questions, and feedback time, so that's why we got this cordless mic, so please put me to work right now. Who has comments? Who took something from this, what Darren had? Who, who was taking notes? Raise your hands. Okay, I see about 20 who were taking notes. Oh, Bobby, you got, you, you got comments? I just want a question right now. Oh, oh. I just want to say that. Can you hear me? Can you see me on which camera? That's him right there. Darren. Peace. Peace, my brother. This is Jahi. This is Kalindi's brother. I just wanted to say, God bless you, man. And uh, thank you for your work with my brother. And thank you for what you do. And uh, I'm definitely going to make it over to the UK. And we're going to hug it out and get some things done. Uh, much appreciated, bro, for sharing that, man. One love. One love. Who has, who has got some feedback for Darren? Just put your hands up. Come on, man. Man, my head, he, he, he five hours in front. No feedback, no comments, no questions. Okay, all right, here we go. Darren, this is the part. Who has who have, who have got a question? I'm coming, I'm coming that way down. Got another one. Hey, I'm Sabrina. Can I see you, please? Hi, from my team from Brooklyn. Oh, well, now, oh, you oh, you don't work the crowd, huh? That's what you're doing. So I guess Darren wants to see y'all. So if y'all got, if y'all want to come up, come up and ask him a question, he wants y'all to come up here in front of the camera. Awkward. You see Peace. It? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Nice. Um, my question is, when and how did you start this journey towards re-educating yourself, relearning yourself, and who you are? When did it start? Well, how and when? Tell us about how. I'll be, I always say like, for me, it started as early as I can remember. I remember being in nursery and just being lied to and it not, um, it not sitting well with me. So I went to a Catholic nursery or what would you call it? Like preschool. Yeah, and they used to ask me to draw colors of Jesus. And I used to try and draw, not even try, I wanted to draw him brown. And they told me I wasn't allowed to draw him brown. So these were the things that used to trigger me in like, why can't I do that? And I just felt like I was being lied to. So um, that was the journey. That's why I started inquiring. But consciously, it was through Public Enemy and Ice Cube. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back and America's Most Wanted. That triggered me and made me check out Nation of Islam. And they made me check out people like the Holy Tabernacle and Pan-African Congress and you name it. And then people like Bobby Hemet, Phil Valentine and Aline Bay and Wayne Chandler. These are all been the people that have inspired me, man, along with Kalinde. 
Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, man. Come on, Queen. We all family. Y'all need to get over that shy shit, man. Y'all come on over here. I got something to say. <laughs> Peace. How are you? Greetings. Pieces. Beautiful so, talk. Thank you. So uh, my question is related to Ishtar. I have a very kin name to Sophia. And so when I look at Sophia from Gnosticism, there are these realms that is often discussed that I'm calling cosmology. Do you have any mushroom messages as it relates to Sophia and her realms and heavens? If I'll be honest, no. I just know that in my, my perspective, there's just that one story, that one mother archetype. So it's easy for me, I just boom and look at the characteristics and the consistencies. So what we're looking at is basically the source of wisdom, as I understand so well, is, you know, relating to the wisdom. So um, for me, it's that same knowledge of where, of the way that we would access that wisdom and where is that, where is it located? And that's within, and that's where those journeys and what these goddesses are all about, supporting you and taking that journey within. Thank into you. the dark realms, the dark goddesses and all that type of stuff. Thank you. I got two questions. Uh, what's your definition of success? Is that me? What's my definition? Of success. Of success. Doing you, man, doing you. Hello? Now we thought you were still listening. We thought you were still listening for some more ancestors to come and give you something else. You was like looking to the side like you were still thinking. No, that's it, man. Getting up every day and doing you is, is success, man. But bro, I can't see nobody, man. I, like, I feel left out. <laughs> trust, trust me, nobody. Everybody's pinned to the seats. Um, and, then my, and then my next question is, where do you see yourself and this particular movement, you working with the KI Network in three years from now? You just sit back, take a nice deep inhale. You know, what, like, what's your dream situation? What's your ideal situation in 2022, 2023? Like, what is happening? So we just boom. You just, somebody from the, you know, you just went to the future, you saw 2023, and then you came back, and then I put you on the camera, and you was like, all right, Dean, you got 30 seconds or one minute to tell us what we are doing in 2023. What's popping? All right, you're going to get that exclusive, bro. I've been holding it down, but it's, it's all about Jamaica. It's all about Jamaica? Yeah. What does that mean? Come on, you gotta go. That's 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 that's, that's vague and ambiguous. You know, be a little more specific. All right. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fact that Jamaica is the only second place in the world where mushrooms are legal to use, and it's the only place where you will find our people too. In the Caribbean, they're the most challenged people in the Caribbean, where I think they are the most in need for the healing with the mushrooms, and I believe there's going to be a wave or something taking place there in the next three years. And it's going to have a butterfly effect on the rest of the world. Because if we can work with the most challenging people, the most affected people in the Caribbean, you know, and get results, then I believe there's room for everybody to, you know, for it to open up some, you know, other avenues. So, um, yeah, man, I've just been doing, looking into a lot of stuff that's going on there and how we can get our people there. Have, have you been keeping up with the uh, decriminalization movement that's happening here in America? I have been, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, give me some quick thoughts on like decrim, like decrim nature, because like they're in the building, they're working with the KI network today. Decrim Ann Arbor's in here, Decrim Erie's in here, Portland Psychedelics is in here, Scores in here. So like, you know, what do you see? You know what I mean? And like, as far as that movement, as far as decriminalizing nature. Yeah, man, I'm all for it because nature's not a criminal. That's what I do. Know. Nature's not a criminal for it to be decriminalized. So I, like, I've never under, I've never really understood that. But what I do know, if I be honest and straight with you, I'm a, I'm on. I come from the premise of getting where you fit in and do what you do. So I've not waited for things to become legal for me to do it, and I'm not. I wouldn't expect people to wait 
for it to be elite. Like, if that's what you need to do, if that's what makes you feel comfortable, cool. But I'm not waiting for that. And I'm not, I wouldn't suggest people waiting for, especially where I am in the UK, man. We're so far behind you guys. And people are like, yeah, when it becomes decriminalized and it's legalized, I'm like, listen, man, I've done a lot worse. <laughs> so um i'm just for like if you've got a weight and that's what you need to do and campaign and do that all for it i'm like i, I totally get it but i also get the people that we can't lose another generation bro that's how i feel and that's what's going to happen man we're going to i'm going to lose another generation if i can't if i've got to wait five years ten years before they decriminalize it here i want to i want to lose another generation just, just, just the same way hold on what you say we're not asking for permission anymore she said, we're not asking for permission anymore. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Like, we just do. We just got to do what we got to do. Absolutely. Y'all give it up for Darren. <laughs> Some of the open the borders, bro. Some of the open the borders, you already know what it is. You know what yeah, I mean? man, I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Uh, we got plane ticket money for Darren so he can be here next year. Next year. <laughs> Right. Let me go in here and pass the hat real quick. Hey, bro, I appreciate what you do. Thank you for checking in with us, man. And um, we just getting ready to keep on keeping on, man. I appreciate you. I love you, kid. Bro, I appreciate you. Before you go, man, I just appreciate you all giving me the time and space and the technology has allowed us to do this. Bro, I, know, I don't know how you pull this one off, man. I really don't. In a short space of time, under the circumstances, I know it takes the community to come together. So please just support the brother and the family and... If we can get this cracking next year, I'll definitely be there, man. And um, I wish you all just an amazing two more days or today and tomorrow. And obviously with the memorial, man. And please, oi, man, if you can get some footage and send it to me on WhatsApp or something, man, just so or if there's people in there filming it, I don't want to wait till it's on YouTube. Just send me on WhatsApp or something, man. Say less, bro. Say less. I'll be with you. I can be there. Got that, bro. Say less. Say less. Hey, so look, so Darren is on. Um, so Darren is on. Is Darren LeBaron on Instagram? So when we are uh, streaming, because I told everybody when we're streaming here, tag him in everything because he knows how to pull it down from IG. So like, if you're streaming, you can just add him, and do, or as soon as it's over, you just send it to him. As soon as you're Please. recording something, you just send it to him, and then he'll take it from there. Because that's why I said, like, this is liquid culture. We're sending him spores. Once he gets the spores, he know what to do with it. Like, he has the UK on lock. You don't, like, for some of you, how many of you are, raise your hands if you don't know who this is. This is your first time meeting first. Raise your hand real high if you do not know this. Why would you think Kalinde would tell me five times, bring this person to Atlanta? Why would you, he just kept repeating, bring this, bring this, you, you must bring this dude. He was talking about bring his spores over here with our fruiting chain. So this is what we're doing. We're taking our spores and putting it in, it in his fruiting chain. So then when they move this scamdemic thing out of the way and we connect, yeah. then we all eat fruit together. When we're all we're eating fruit and when he come over here, we're breaking big bread. We're breaking big, big, big bread. Big Jesus, big Jesus clusters. Yeah, man. Holy communion, holy communion. So on three, everybody, y'all get Darren in peace. One, two, three. Peace, peace, family. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. We can't do it without the teacher. All right, God, I'm gonna holler at you. Peace. Oh, peace. Okay, that was good. Uh, how do I stop it? Okay, stop recording.